Good morning, everyone. Is anybody else as excited as I am about the fact that spring is here, almost summer? If you're a gardener like me, you probably are, yes. Anyway, let's stand together. We're going to praise the Lord together for his beautiful creation in spring and the fact that he's risen again. reading this morning is from Psalm 86, 5. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Psalm 86,
next song is one that we did a couple of weeks ago. It's new, but got a lot of positive feedback about this. A beautiful new hymn, My Worth Is Not In What I Own. is not in what I own, not in the strength of which I own, but in the costly ways of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, Be seated. Good morning, church. It is so good to be here worshiping with you this morning. I was just thinking about this morning that um, a year ago, I didn't exactly know where um, I was headed and, and where life was, was going and how many things have changed in my life in the last 12 months. And so I am just so grateful um, to be here and, and part of the church here. Uh, but I also thought, you know, we all have changes going on in our life, don't we? Life doesn't just stay the same. But we have a true and eternal God who does not change. Amen? 
And so it's a wonderful thing to know that no matter what happens in our lives, no matter what changes occur, God is faithful and he does not change. Well, I'm so glad you're here this morning. And if you're new here this morning, um, we're, we're glad you're here as well. And so I um, want to invite you, if you haven't already, to stop uh, in the lobby at the Visitor Center. And they would love to chat with you there and um, tell you about our church and get to know you better. Well, um, let's, uh, in the spirit of fellowship, why don't we stand and greet one another? Hello, this is Pastor Brett, and uh, we're so glad you could tune in this morning to our worship service, and uh, we would love to hear from you. If you are interested more about our church, please go ahead and give us a call um, on our phone number. It's uh, located on the website, and so we'd love to uh, hear from you. But we're so glad you tuned in. We hope you have a blessed day and that you're ministered to by the Lord's Word. God bless. Okay, if we could all make it back to our spots, we are going to go ahead and read together from the book of Luke, chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. This is our verse of the month, and so we want to go ahead and continue to think about this. Go ahead and let's find our spots. This passage we're going to be reading throughout the month of May because we are doing a series on forgiveness. And um, so one of the um, prayers that Jesus taught us to prayer um, teaches us about how to forgive because we have been forgiven. So let's go ahead and read together Luke eleven two through 4. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Luke 11, 2 through 4. You may be seated. I want to invite John to come on up and give us some announcements. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I want to think back a year from ago. We didn't know where we were headed. We didn't know who was headed towards us. We were enthused, we were praying, but I think now today we can look back and say that God was extremely faithful to us in those days and very gracious to bring us Brett Siegelkoff and the Siegelkoff family. Amen? Amen. 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 And I'm looking forward to the challenge of your three-week series on forgiveness, Brett. Seriously, I am. I am. We want to welcome all of you today, and I want to encourage if you're a, here for the first time or the first time in a long time, or a regular, at the outside of the pews, there are these registration slips, and we encourage all of you to fill one of these out, for you or your family at least, and pass them, uh, or just leave them on the pews there, and we'll pick those up a little bit later. Just a couple of announcements. Ladies, if you're in, interested in Bunko Night on May 19th, write Bunko on that registration slip. Now folks, Bunko is one of those terms that I read and I recognize, but don't ask me to define it. Do you ever have those? 
If I came up to you right now and told you, ask you to tell me what Bunko's about, some of you would pause. So I, I looked it up. And here's all I, I really cared about. It says, as it is played today, Bunko is a social dice game involving 100% luck and no skill. There are no decisions to be made. Sounds like a fun time. So ladies, Bunko on your registration slip. Also, in two weeks, I guess, the 20th, we want to have a baptism service here on the 20th. So please, contact Bast Pastor Brett if you're interested in baptism. And then mark your calendar for the 27th. It's Memorial Day weekend. It's that Sunday. It's the 27th. And we're going to have our big Memorial Day picnic. Right in the center of your uh, folder is the information about the Memorial Day service on the 27th, and more information will be coming. And please be sure and read the rest of your bulletin. There's lots of good information in there to keep up with what's happening here at Caldwell First Baptist. Brett? Well, we want to go ahead and um, talk a little bit about our two missionaries of the week. And um, the first we have here is Mel and Patty Davis. And uh, we would like to go ahead and send them a letter. So I'm going to go ahead and have this envelope here. And I'm going to just tell you a little bit about them. So we have somebody who's going to go ahead and send a letter to them. And um, they are ministering in Slovenia there in Europe. And um, some of the prayer requests they have for us is that um, they've launched a men's and women's Bible study groups. Mel is teaching the theology of salvation, and Patty is teaching um, the women in Colossians. And so they're praying for a, a just that th those go well, that um, they're able to really impact the ladies with the, and the men with the word of God. Um, also, um, they wanted to pray for Gabriella, uh, who is a lady who's a believer that they're working with. And um, they are reaching out to her family and neighbors. So um, she believes, but they're working with her to reach out to the people around. So it uh, can be so, so difficult, can't it, to try to reach friends and neighbors with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So please keep them in prayer um, as they are ministering over there. The um, other group we want to uh, pray for is um, Eric and Adriana Lapp. And um, they are serving in Mexico. And I want to give you a little bit of update about them. Anybody want to go ahead and send them a, a letter? Go ahead and raise your hand. Um, they are meeting with um, men, women, and teens in three different prisons, having Bible studies and counseling with individuals and their families. So they're doing a lot of prison ministry, um, and um, they're also doing weekly Bible clubs for about 30 children and several of their parents. And so they're saying that God is doing a mighty work in Mexico. They do ask for prayer that they have changed locations, and so that always causes a lot of upheaval. Talk about that change, you know, that we all experience. They also are asking for prayer for weekly safety. Here's a little snapshot into what some of the missionaries that we support are going through. It says they recently were held in the middle of a prison riot when they were ministering in the prisons, and now they're also facing the increase of the drug cartel violence in the area in which they are. So it is dangerous, and your prayers would be coveted. Also, please pray for the children in the New Bible Club. Um, several have uh, medical issues that they're trying to address and help uh, and lead them to Christ. So um, please keep them in prayer um, as, as you think about them. Um, we know that um, they much appreciate the prayers that we offer up for them. Well, this is the time of our offering, and as the um, ushers um, are prepared to receive our offering this morning, I want to mention that this is our act of worship. This is a time that's part of our service where we give to the Lord, acknowledging that um, we're not about what we own, right? That all the things that we own are God's, and we want to go ahead and, and give some of those things to him so that he may use them for his kingdom. So would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we praise and honor you because you have been so faithful. You are the God of the universe who loves even the, the smallest, most insignificant uh, seeming person in this world. Lord, nobody is insignificant in your eyes. Jesus came to die for every single person and offer the forgiveness of sins. And so I pray, Lord, that we are overwhelmed with your love for us, that, that you are so focused in on your people, that you hear every prayer that we pray, that you uh, know every experience and every hardship and every joy that we go through. You know it all, and you want to intimately walk with us, Lord. And I pray that that knowledge would cause us to want to walk with you. And I pray that that starts this morning, Father, that, that we would be seeking your face, that we would be a people who have come here longing to worship you, longing to enter into your presence so that we can say that, that 
that this is the best place to be, which is in your presence with your people, worshiping you together. Lord, build our anticipation for what you're doing this morning and in our lives. And help us, Lord, to long for your love and for the appearing of Jesus Christ. And we pray this in your name. Amen. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. And we're so glad that the kids are here, here with us this morning. Uh, as we start this series on forgiveness. It's a three-part series. And then John Titor is going to be preaching on the fourth Sunday uh, here in May. And um, so I'm excited about this series. I know that God has already been really working in my heart um, on this issue of forgiveness. And um, we're asking ourselves the question this morning, do I have to forgive? And um, it's kind of like a little boy who was sitting on a park bench who was making this face that was just grimaced. He was just, looked like he was in a lot of pain. And this man was walking by the boy and, and, said, and said, young man, you look like you're in pain. Are you okay? And he says, I'm sitting on a bumblebee. And so the man said, well, why don't you stand up so that, you know, you can be free of the bumblebee? And he says, well, because I think I'm hurting him more than he's hurting me. <laughs> Sometimes we get to that point uh, when we try to figure out if we must forgive, right? Sometimes it feels better to not forgive and to hold a grudge. And... Um, as we look at this issue of what becomes the motivation for us to forgive, why would we forgive, we, are, we find a pattern in Scripture. And um, you see this throughout the New Testament, and even in the Lord's Prayer, uh, we, we read from Luke this morning, but also in the book of Matthew, the main one that we usually read, it says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So what we see in this passage that talks about forgiveness is linked with our forgiveness of other people is God's forgiveness of us. He says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So there's a link between God's forgiveness of us and our forgiveness of others. It gets even more clear in Ephesians chapter four, verse 32. It says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted." forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And so when you look at that, it says, you know, we want to be kind, we want to be tenderhearted and forgive one another. But remember that as you're forgiving one another, do it in the way that Christ has forgiven you and because Christ has forgiven you. It gives even more clear in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. It says this, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Now the word that I get caught up in that passage is, is the word must, right? And what it's saying here is it's saying, remember to forgive people in the church that you have a complaint against, or even people in your lives, as the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive. 
And that should cause all of us to pause and say, why must I forgive because I have been forgiven? Why does my forgiveness mean that I have to forgive other people? Well, there's a couple of reasons I believe that, that, that God wants to tag on this extra emphasis on forgiveness and the connection that we forgive because we've been forgiven. I think the first reason why God seems to say in his word and keeps saying that, that this is the reason and that this is the desire, this is the, the thing that compels us, is that forgiveness is one of the hardest things that God calls us to do, isn't it? It's one of the hardest things God calls us to do because when our sense of justice has been offended, to overcome that sense of justice, the wrong that has been done to us, seems most of the time like an impossibility. Even sometimes if we have an inkling to restore the relationship, the offense overcomes that, and so we have a difficult time finding the heart to forgive. But on the other hand, the reason why he tells us this is because it is the number one way that we display the love and mercy of Christ in this world. For instance, not long before she died, a lady named Marganita Lasky, a well-known secular humanist and novelist, once told an interviewer, quote, what I envy most about you Christians is your forgiveness. I have nobody to forgive me. That's a powerful truth. And we are known in the world because of our forgiveness. You see and, and read about some of the greatest stories of Christians, you will find at the center of those great stories, stories of forgiveness, because the world does not understand free forgiveness. It is something that is of God. And so God wants us to display forgiveness, but he also recognizes that it is the hardest thing that he asks us to do. And so he reminds us that when he says, I want you to forgive and remember that we forgive because we have been forgiven. And when we understand that, that becomes the greatest motivation for forgiveness. So before we continue on next week and the week after talking about how we share forgiveness, we wanna talk about this morning is why we would forgive and why would I even feel like I have to forgive. So take a look at Matthew chapter 18. We're gonna look at verse 21 on through verse 35. And we're gonna be looking at the parable of the unforgiving servant. And we're just gonna walk through the, the story slowly to unpack and understand this story and, and what it means. So let's read verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came up and said to him, that is Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Some of you, your versions say 70 times seven. And so we have this context here where Jesus in Matthew 18 has been talking about forgiving your brother. In verse 15, he says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. So this, there's this discussion in chapter 18 about reconciliation. And so Peter's trying to figure out how many times he should forgive. He's asking the same question we're asking this morning is, do I have to forgive? And if I do, how many times? How often do I have to do this? Now he says, as many as seven times, Jesus? Should I forgive as many as seven times? And the reason Peter said that was that uh, rabbinical teaching said that the most that you should forgive somebody is three times. And by the fourth time, you can be done. So you can forgive somebody once, you can forgive them for the same sin twice, you can forgive them three times, but four times, all bets are off. Then I'm done. I don't know how you keep track of that, <laughs> so tallying all the offenses that people have done against you, but they said by the fourth time, you can stop forgiving them and you can hold a grudge. So Peter felt like he was being very magnanimous. He was saying, well, what about seven times? I mean, seven is the number of perfection, right? Seven is a wonderful number. It's, it's over twice as many times as the rabbinical teaching. And we can see here that Peter has begun to learn about what it means to be gracious because he began to understand that Jesus is gracious. And so he says, all the way up to seven times, he felt like he was being extremely generous. Even seven times I could forgive someone? Jesus blows him away. He says, I say to you not, seven times, but 77 times, or 70 times seven. Now the reason why our different versions say different things is because Greek scholars have a difficult time understanding what this Greek word means, and the older understanding was it was 70 times seven, which is 490 times. Um, current thinking, and this is why your ESV says this, is 77 times, is that they think that that word really means 77. Either way, what it's saying is, is you are to keep forgiving, and keep forgiving, and keep forgiving. Even the smaller number of 77 times is a lot, right? 
Can you imagine forgiving someone that they've sinned against you over and over up to 77 times? That's a lot. That's a lot of times to say you're forgiven. And what Jesus is, is ultimately saying here is, I just want you to keep forgiving. Just, there's no limit. There's no ceiling. There's no cap on the amount of times that we are to forgive someone for their sins. Which you can imagine that the disciples all just went, <gasps> are you serious? How is that humanly possible? I mean, we all would probably react the same way, right? And say, Jesus, are you saying that I should just keep on forgiving people and keep on forgiving people and just not have a limit and not decide that I'm done for, with forgiveness? And so Jesus recognizes that they are shocked and in awe, and so he tells them a parable, which is, I believe, one of the most powerful parables about forgiveness in the whole Bible. Verse 23. We begin verse 23, and I, there's three scenes of this parable. Let's look at scene one. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. So what we see here is we see a king. And Jesus said, this king is like God. This is like the kingdom of heaven. And this king wanted to settle accounts. That means he was calling all debts in. It's time to pay your debts. And one servant came to him, and it was found out that he owed 10,000 talents. Now, we don't really know what talents are. We think of talents as a show we go to where people show off their skills, right? Well, 10,000 talents was a phenomenal amount of money. A talent was the highest financial denomination in the land of Israel. It was the largest piece of coin, usually made out of gold. And just to give us a comparison of 10,000 talents, you remember when the Jews all gave gold to create the temple, to build the temple, right? And you know the temple was just layered in gold everywhere. It was full of gold. It was the envy of other nations that they wanted to come and take that gold. And we see through the book of First and Second Kings that they do just that. So a phenomenal amount of gold. And all of the gold in the temple equaled 8,000 talents. So this one individual had racked up so much debt that he owed this king more than all of the gold in the temple. That's a lot of gold. This man was incredibly irresponsible with his life. He just kept taking and taking, borrowing and borrowing to fulfill his needs, to satisfy whatever he wanted, not considering that one day that his accounts would be called in. Well, the day finally came in this parable, and it found out he couldn't pay. Of course he couldn't pay. Some people say that it equaled, the lowest number I've heard that this equaled in our, in our dollars is 10 million, and the highest number possibly would be $1 trillion. Can you imagine if we just took that highest number and somebody um, called in the debts of, of a person and said, you owe a trillion dollars, why don't you pay me back now? How impossible that would be. We have to grasp the impossibility of this man's ability to pay off his debt. And we see that the result of this is, is in verse 25. So since he could not pay off his debt, the master ordered him to be sold into slavery, not only him, but his wife and his children. So his whole family was going to be sold off into slavery. We, we, what we must understand is that even though they were all going to be sold into slavery, they would never have been able to pay off this debt. So what it's saying is, is you're going to now be in slavery paying off a debt you could never pay off for the rest of your life. Not only you, but your wife and your children. You see, um, when people owed a debt back then, the, 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 the full extent of the law said that if they don't pay you back, you can put them in, in jail or, or put them in slavery until they pay off your debt. In this case, they could never pay off their debt, so this was more of a punishment than anything. Well, if you put yourself in the servant's shoes, you could recognize the hopelessness which the situation would present. Here I am, I've racked up a, a debt that's almost incalculable, and now that those debts have been called in, and now I'm going to spend, and my family, to spend the rest of our lives in slavery. So what does he do? It says, verse 26, servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay everything. Now, that's a ridiculous statement, isn't it? He can't repay everything. 
It's like someone saying, yeah, sure, I'll work really hard 24 hours a day for the next 10 years. I'll pay off my $1 trillion debt. Well, that wouldn't even make a chink in it, would it? It wouldn't, it wouldn't even get any kind of forward movement in paying off his debt that it was of any significance. But you can see the desperation in his heart, the desperation that he has because he can't pay his debts. And then the king does an amazing, surprising thing that his audience, Jesus' audience, would have been just blown away by. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. He says he had pity on him, which is my favorite Greek word, splagnizomai, which means he had compassion in the heart. He had mercy. He had a forgiving heart. He looked upon this man. He realized that his life was forfeit. He, looked, he realized that this man has squandered everything for his own pleasure, for his own riches. And he says, I'm going to have pity on you. I'm going to release you from your imprisonment. And I'm going to completely forgive your debts. So notice what this man started with. He started out with a hopeless situation going before the king knowing all the time he was racking up the debt that he'd have to come pay it. He walks out of the king's palace being completely free of his debt. Nothing more to pay. He has a clean slate. Everything has been forgiven. Can you imagine the joy that that would bring this man? Can you imagine the life change that that should have brought into his life? How amazing that experience would have been, and it would have changed your outlook on life, wouldn't it, to have received such good forgiveness. But then we have seen two where things don't turn out as we expect. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. Seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, I will pay you. He refused and went to put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. This is another surprising turn of the story. This servant who has been forgiven so much finds a fellow servant who owns, owes him 100 denarii. And one denarii is one day's labor, one day's work worth of wages. And so he owed a third of a year worth, work of wa- worth of wages, which is nothing compared to the 10,000 talents that he owed. And this man could have actually paid off that debt. A third of a year of debt is something somebody could legitimately pay off. And yet what you see here is the anger and rage of the servant who was owed the money. It says he began to choke him. And you can imagine that as he's choking him, the anger, the rage of this this smaller debt that this man owes him and saying, you owe me this and I want it now. And the man begins to plead with the servant. And he says almost the exact same words that that the, the man who was collecting the debt had said to the king. He says, be patient with me, I'll pay what I owe. And he could have actually done it. But instead of forgiving it, instead of um, even going for the idea that the man could pay it off, he goes to the full extent of the law and says, no, I'm going to make you pay. And so he puts him in prison, debtor's prison, until he pays it all off. He goes to the full extent of the law, and he is unforgiving. Now, now he was in his legal rights to do this, but we'll notice quickly as we think about this that what he is lacking is a changed life. What he is lacking is the same mercy with which he received. He was able to hold a grudge legitimately by the law and show that he had not been changed, which takes us to scene three. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? In other words, he's saying, my mercy for you with such a great debt should have led to a changed way that you treat other people, especially with these smaller debts that they owe you, but they didn't. And so you show that your heart was actually wicked. You were not changed by the way I treated you in the example that I showed you. So verse 34, in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Amazingly, this man received the original consequence that he was going to get which was to be put in prison until he paid off his debt which would be never and that's actually what he ended up getting at the end of the story 
And then verse 35, now the word of God points to us. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Hmm. Powerful. Powerful statement. A powerful story. Because what he points to is he says, if you are the unforgiving servant, if that's you, he says that you don't understand forgiveness. It has not come into your heart and impacted you greatly. So, from this parable, as we apply this to our lives, there are three fundamental questions we need to ask ourselves. Three fundamental questions we need to ask ourselves to unpack this parable for us so that we can really understand what it means. And the first parable is this, what debt do I owe God? If I am possibly the unforgiving servant in this story, and this man owed 10,000 talents of gold, this incalculable amount of money, then what is that saying about me? If, if I'm that person, what great debt has God forgiven me? If he's the king and I'm the servant, what, what is this sin debt that I owe God? Kind of like the story um, about a Sunday school teacher who just concluded her lesson and wanted to make sure that she had made her point. So she asked her kids as she was teaching Sunday, as she was finishing up Sunday school, wrapping things up, she said, can anyone tell me what you must do before you can obtain forgiveness for sin? The kids thought about it, it was silent, and then in the back of the room, a little boy raised his hand and he said, sin? <laughs> of course. That has to happen, right, for us to be forgiven. We actually have to sin. But, but there are times when we struggle with the idea that we are sinners or that we have a great debt of sin. Maybe we'll even admit that, that we sin on a regular basis. But have we grossly sinned against God to the maximum effect? Have we sinned against God to such an incalculable degree that we can be amazed at the forgiveness that he brings? I know for, for all of us, we all wonder, how much have I really sinned against God? I mean, I'm not that bad of a person, right? Well, when we look at the scriptures, it's the scriptures that is the, the, the double-edged sword that cuts right to our soul. It says, I'm gonna tell you what sin is. And when you look at what sin is, we begin to realize what great debt we owe God and what great sinners we are. So there are three things that we have to remember about our own debt that we owe God. And the first is this, our every action Everything we do is polluted to God. Every action that we do, everything that we do is in some way polluted by and stained by sin. Take a look at Romans chapter 3, verse 12. I'm just going to read a whole bunch of verses. They're going to be up there on the board. You don't have to turn there. But the impact should be that we'll see that the Scripture says so many things about sin and develops this idea of the depth of it. Romans 3, 12 says this. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. What's the exception to not even one? There is no exception, right? And what it's saying is no one does good. No one seeks to do good perfectly without sin. There's always some amount of sin in the things that we do. And so when we think about it, we can think about the things that we do that are sin against God, like Romans 3, 15 through 17 says. Their feet are swift to shed blood, in their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. This describes every single person who has ever lived on this earth, that, that we are swift to shed blood, we are swift to do things in actions that are a sin against God. In our paths are ruin and misery. We, we, we do things with our, with our hands and, and with our choices that, that cause misery and, and ruin, and we don't always understand the way of peace. When we apply that to ourselves, we can think about how many times we have sinned with our actions. How many times have we sinned with our actions? How many times have we struck someone in anger? How many times have we yelled at someone in anger? How many times have we walked away muttering in bitterness against another individual or talking about them behind their backs? How many times have we ever used our hands to do evil, to do sin? Start adding those things up. Start counting those things up and we begin to realize that it adds up to a lot. But it doesn't stop there because the scripture makes something, a, a point about something that, that we don't often think about is that, and that is this. Even our righteous deeds are polluted to God. If every action we do is a pollution to God somehow by sin, even the good things that we do are polluted to God. Take a look at this verse in Isaiah 64, 6. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. 
We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. It says that even our righteous deeds, even the good things that we do are somehow tainted by sin and selfishness. Even the good things that we do somehow have a twinge of, of something that is from a selfish heart or, or a prideful heart or, or a desire to get self-accolades. I was um, watching a TV show about, about people who had gone to hell and they just realized that they'd gone to hell and people were looking at this one lady and they were wondering why she was there and they said, you've done only good all your life. And she looked back and once she realized why she was there, she said, yes, but all of the good deeds I did were to promote myself. All of the things that I did were to make me look better than my sister. All of the good deeds I did had, a, had an aspect of selfishness in them. She began to realize that even her righteous deeds, even her good deeds, even the things she did for charities were done with some twinge of sin. And, and so we can come to the conclusion from these scriptures that everything we do is somehow twinged by Pollute by, by sin and polluted to God. God sees the things we do for the motivations that we actually have. Secondly, our every thought is an offense to God. Every thought we have, all the things that go on in our minds, the things that other people don't see, are somehow an offense to God. As Romans 1.28 says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. You see, at the beginning of time when man was sinning, God gave them over to a debased mind and gave all of us over to a way of thinking that is somehow colluded by sin, is somehow um, corrupted by sin, so that every thought we think has some twist of sin in it. It has some, some twinge of sin in it. And of course, the things we think spring up from the heart. And what does the scripture say about the heart? Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? So what springs up from inside of us, it says, is deceitful above all things. Desperately sick. It's somehow marred by our sin. Who can possibly understand our hearts? So even the good things that we think about God somehow have some sort of uh, twist in them from our sinful minds and our sinful hearts. Our thinking is flawed by our sinful hearts. And then thirdly this, our every breath is a rebellion against God. Every breath we breathe is in a rebellion against God. That, that, that even if we are not doing sin or thinking about sin, our existence by having a sinful nature is a rebellion against God. Sin is ultimately rebellion against God and we live with rebellious hearts. We live with sin nature in our hearts. As Romans 1.21 says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they came futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. We became futile in our thinking, our hearts were darkened, but it all started because we refused to honor God as God. And so sin began as a dishonoring of God and a rebellion against him. And, and even the people of God in the Old Testament were called out for their rebellion against him. Deuteronomy 9.24 says this, Moses says this to the people of Israel, you have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. And Jeremiah 5.23 says this, but this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and gone astray. They have gone away. These are the people of God. It says that they have a rebellious heart. And so we have these naturally rebellious hearts that are rebelling against God, and every breath we breathe is with that sin nature, and so it can be an offense to God. Well, gee, pastor, this is a real downer. Right? Right? But here's why I'm bringing this up to you. First of all, I want to say this. I'm with you. We are all in this same boat. But we must remember the incalculable debt that we come to God with. When Jesus is saying in the parable that if we're the people who owe 10,000 talents, he's saying it's for real. It's not for just a couple of sins we did throughout this entire year. He's saying that we rack up sins like crazy. We rack up sins every moment we can't even probably count the amount of sins we've racked up in the last 45 minutes. And we don't even know it because we're ignorant of most of these sins. We don't even realize these things. We have to remember that we have an incalculable debt, but that's what makes forgiveness so great, amen? Amen? 
That's what makes forgiveness so great is because we've been forgiven for so much. God's not kidding when he says that we are sinners because we sin in ways that we don't even understand. The things I just mentioned to you, we don't even fully understand in what ways we sin. But I do know this. I know that we have been forgiven of everything, that when we come to Jesus Christ and we ask for mercy and we ask him to forgive our debts, he says, forgiven, all of it, all of your sinful thoughts, all of your sinful deeds, all of your rebellious heart, all of it has been forgiven for now and to eternity. That's a reason to shout. So understanding the depth of our sin leads us to understand the depth of God's mercy. Kind of like D.L. Moody. Of course, I went to Moody Bible Institute, so I have to quote from D.L. Moody occasionally. He visited a prison called the Tombs to preach to the inmates. And after he had finished speaking, Moody talked with a number of men in their cells, and he asked the prisoner this question, what brought you here? Why are you in prison? Again and again, he received replies like, I don't deserve to be here. I was framed. I was falsely accused. I was given an unfair trial. Not one inmate would admit that they were guilty until finally Moody found a man with his face buried in his hands weeping. What's wrong, my friend, he inquired. The prisoner responded, my sins are more than I can bear. He was relieved to find one man that would recognize his sin and need of forgiveness. And D.L. Moody said, thank God for that. Thank God for that, that your sins are more than you can bear, that you feel the depth of your sin because there's hope and forgiveness for you. So then he began to have the joy of pointing him to Jesus Christ, and he believed in Christ for the forgiveness of his sins. We have to acknowledge our sin so that we can understand how much we've been forgiven for, so that we can say, amazing grace, amazing grace that saved a what like me? A wretch. If I'm a wretch and God would forgive me all of the sins that I've ever done, then that changes my heart. But I, go, I come to the second question, and that is this. Why would God forgive me? Why would God even do such a thing so wonderful and so glorious as to forgive me? As we look at the parable, as we, as we saw, out of pity, splagnizo my, the king forgave his servant. But I want to say that, the, that, that God does it for even greater reason than the parable shows, and that is this. There are two reasons why God would even forgive me. First, God loves you. God loves you, God loves me. And God who is a God of love wants to reconcile with us. A God who is a God of love does not want, want to let sin impede his relationship with us. And so as God pursues us, he wants to put on love and bind us together with him in perfect unity and perfect harmony. And so God has a desire to not let your sins keep you away from him. He wants, in love, to have a relationship with you for all eternity. But love is not enough, is it? God can't just say, you know what, I'll just pretend to forgive, forget about your sins from a God who can't forget about sins. God can't just throw these things, our sins aside and say, well, you know, it's no big deal. I'll get over it. Because God's justice has been offended by us. And so that leads us to the second reason why God would forgive me. Because God's love sent Jesus to pay our debts for us. You see, your debt has been paid, but it hasn't just been written off because somebody has to pay it. And the person who has paid for our sin is Jesus Christ. One pastor said it like this. There is one eternal principle which will be valid as long as the world lasts. The principle is forgiveness is a costly thing. Human forgiveness is costly. A son or a daughter may go wrong, a father or a mother may forgive, but that forgiveness has brought tears. There was a price of a broken heart to pay. But divine forgiveness is even more costly. God is love, but God is also holiness. God, least of all, cannot break the great moral laws on which the universe is built because they are his laws. Sin must have its punishment or the very structure of life disintegrates. And God alone can pay the terrible price that is necessary for man before man can be forgiven. Forgiveness is never a case of saying, it's all right, it doesn't matter. Forgiveness is the most costly thing in the world. And Jesus paid that price. He paid that almost infinite cost that each and every one of us has incurred. He paid our debts. He forgave every sin by paying for it on the cross. 
You know, I, I've asked some people, what do you think was the greatest story of forgiveness in the Bible? There's a lot of options that can, can come up, right? Joseph forgiving his brothers. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. We, we have all kinds of stories of amazing pieces of forgiveness. Hosea. But I want to ask you to turn to Acts chapter 2 to one of the most amazing stories of forgiveness. One that's often looked over. Acts chapter 2. You remember this story. It's the story of Pentecost. And you remember at Pentecost that, that the Holy Spirit had come on the disciples with power and they began to speak in tongues. The tongues of the people, they were amazed and they said, why, why, what is happening here? And so Peter begins to explain this miracle. And he explains to them essentially that Jesus Christ is the son of David, is the Messiah, and he provides forgiveness of sins. But do you remember who was in that crowd of over 3,000 people? Who was in that crowd and what had they done to Jesus? In that crowd, many of them had been the ones who called for his crucifixion. They were the ones who shouted, crucify him, crucify him. They were the ones who called for his death. And notice chapter, or verse 36 in chapter two. This is the offer that God makes to those very people. And let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now at that point, they could have easily said, he's alive, the man we called for crucifixion. Is he he bent on revenge? (laughs) What's he gonna do to me now? He's alive, we we had him killed. We wanted him to be dead. We We have sinned against him in the greatest way possible, which was to have an innocent man killed. But notice the offer in verse 37, it's totally what they didn't expect. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord your God calls to himself. Isn't that a beautiful story of forgiveness? Peter is saying, Jesus whom you crucified, he says, I not only want to forgive you, but I want to bring you into my family. You called for my crucifixion, I forgive it all, and I want to bring you into my family. The people who who called for Jesus' death are now going to be saved by that same Savior. What a wonderful picture of forgiveness, and what a wonderful picture of the heart of God. That if he can forgive these people for killing him, then he can forgive you and I for our incredible sin. And that's how powerful powerful the forgiveness of Jesus is. So why would God forgive me? He loves me. And he sent Jesus to die on the cross for me. And and with that is provided total forgiveness. Which leads us to the third question. So if I am forgiven by such a great debt, why does being forgiven by God mean I must forgive others? So why does all of that mean that I must now be a forgiver? That I must now forgive others? If we turn back to Matthew 18. And we've got to remember that forgiveness involves three things. Forgiveness involves receiving forgiveness. It involves experiencing forgiveness. And it involves sharing forgiveness. We're going to talk about sharing forgiveness in the next two weeks. But before we share forgiveness, we have to experience it after we receive it. You see, when we believe in Jesus Christ, we receive forgiveness, but not every one of us has experienced it. And what I mean is this, we don't, ever, we don't always know exactly how much we've been forgiven for and have appreciation for the mercy that we have received. Sometimes we can become lackadaisical about it, say, I know Jesus forgave me, and I'm really glad about that, and life moves on. But once we understand the depth of the forgiveness that we have received, We're not only supposed to receive it, but we're supposed to experience it. In other words, we are supposed to let it change us and mold us because Jesus has shown us the greatest example of all forgiveness by forgiving us our great sin so that we now become people who love forgiveness. We love mercy. We love grace. And we become people of mercy. We become people of grace. We become people of forgiveness so that forgiveness and mercy are so intertwined into our nature that we must forgive. Take a look at Matthew 18, that's what he's saying, verse 32. His master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? What's he saying? 
He's saying, the mercy I gave you, the debt I forgave you, should have changed you. It should have made you into a different person, a person who loves forgiveness and mercy and grace. But you showed you had a wicked heart that you refused to, be ex- to experience my forgiveness, and so you show that you never really accepted the forgiveness in the first place. That's why he can say in verse 35, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. You see, if we do not have forgiveness in our, of our heart, if we don't share forgiveness, then we're showing that we haven't experienced forgiveness. And if we haven't experienced forgiveness, it may be because we've never really received it. And if we never really received it, then we're really not in God's grace. So in other words, nothing shows that we are in Christ more than having a forgiving spirit, than being a person who desires forgiveness. Now, all of us Christians struggle with forgiveness, right? As we said, it's the hardest thing God calls us to do. But he changes us through our forgiveness to be people who desire mercy, who love grace and want to share it. And so though we may struggle, this will become our hearts. So before we talk about sharing it, and who do we give forgiveness to, and when do we give forgiveness, we'll talk about those. This morning, I want to invite you to experience God's forgiveness. When you experience God's forgiveness, the question of how are you going to forgive somebody who did this thing to you dozens of years ago will become not nearly as difficult. And maybe the reason it is difficult is because we don't fully grasp the and experience the forgiveness God has given us. I gotta tell you, as I was looking over this text and this parable this week, it just rocked me to the core. Because I was overwhelmed and on the verge of tears so many times this week, realizing, God, you have been so merciful to me, a sinner. How could I possibly refuse mercy to anyone around me? Whatever they owe me is nothing in comparison to the, to the forgiveness I have received in Jesus Christ. And, and so as we continue to sing and, and worship our Lord Jesus, I want to invite you to become a person who falls in love with the love and mercy of Jesus, the grace that he offers you. Experience it. Relish in it. Love God because he has given us so much And so as we begin to look at communion here this morning, I want to invite you, this is for anybody who has believed in Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to think about Jesus' payment and think about the the forgiveness that we have. And and, and I want to invite you to confess any sins that you have in your life, to to make sure that, that, that God knows that you know that you're someone who has offended him, but that you don't want that to impede your relationship because ultimately we're all so thankful that all of those sins have been forgiven and so i invite you to thank the lord in prayer and say lord thank you you have forgiven me blend forgiveness into my heart more and more make it a part of my nature make it so to such a point where i must forgive because that's who i am and cause us to think about those things so as the ushers get ready to um help pass out the elements. Let's go ahead and go to the word of the Lord in prayer. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall be forgiven and have eternal life. Lord, let us never forget those words. Let us constantly be amazed at your grace. Let us sing amazing grace with fervor, and and let us be impressed with the weight of our sin, but even more so with the weight of your forgiveness. You have wiped the slate clean, Lord. Help us to not be burdened by the guilt of our sin because you wiped it away. Help us, Lord, not to be consumed with with, um, constant regret by the sins in the past because you have forgiven them. Help us, Lord, to want to run to you and not hide from you because you have opened up your gates to us with open arms and you are ready to receive back the prodigal. And Lord, we contend to be prodigals every day. And so, Lord, I pray that that your forgiveness would overwhelm us like a flood so that it just pours out of our lives on a daily basis so that your love and mercy just become part of who we are and are constantly given out. And so, Lord, we pray all of these things, and we pray that you would would, um, conform us to the image of Christ, who said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Give us that same heart, 
And prepare us, Father God, to forgive those who owe debts to us. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If we can take the cup. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant, which is in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Would you stand with us as we continue to celebrate and worship? I love Communion Sunday. My, my kids are asking all sorts of questions, and 
Um, it's just another opportunity for a reminder for myself and for, for young minds, <laughs> older minds, um, to just bathe ourselves in thankfulness for the forgiveness that we are given through Christ. Hosanna. I see the King of glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole of shades, whole of shades. I see His love and mercy washing over all our sins. The people sing, the people sing. yesterday we're walking out of a small store and there on the rack is a, a, a um, the current one of Christian living and on the cover is a guy named Peter Vasquez and about five years ago we've got the teens we're hiking in the Sawtooth Mountains and I'm back with the the slower crowd and five are up in front and this guy comes pedaling up on a mountain bike big big guy tats all over and so of course I'm like can I help you and he goes, yeah, I was just talking to your kids, and they said they were the youth group, and I, I love God, and I've been forgiven for so much. And I was like, really? And he starts to share his story. He was in San Quentin for, for um, being a gang hitman down in California. Four and a half years in solitary confinement because he was one of the most dangerous prisoners. Came to know Christ in solitary. Gives me his card, and he says, hey, I, I help people out of gangs. You know, I, I help them get employment, all that kind of stuff. I go, great, thanks, shunk. In the pocket it goes. 
A week later at my house, our neighbors, we've been working with them, and, and a knock on the door. A young man comes to the door. He's all beaten up. He'd gotten jumped trying to get out of a gang. And um, we take him to the hospital, and we pray with him. And, and I go, wait a second, you're trying to get out of a gang? He goes, yes. And I haven't had any, any luck. You know, every time I go to get a job, they come and tell my employer, if you keep him on, we're going to destroy your business. They keep jumping him every time. And I go, God just showed up and showed off. Look what I have a card for you. <laughs> And I introduced him to Peter, and I checked in on him a little bit later. He's on his way. He's got jobs. He's, he's praising God. So God loves to forgive, loves to show up, loves to just bless us beyond our understanding. What an amazing God we serve. We're going to finish. Yes, amen, right? He makes himself real. Just let him show up in your life. A Christian's daily prayer. Present you in your name and your forgiveness um, in our families and our communities, Lord. I pray that there would be less of us and more of you each day. Thank you for this this place to come and meet. Thank you for the opportunity to, to fellowship together, Lord. I pray we would not take it for granted. We would recognize that you are the Savior and we are the sinners and we have been saved by grace. Thank you, Lord, for today. And the church said, "Amen." Amen. Thank you so much for coming. You're dismissed.